If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 17, verses 14 to 16. It says it this way, I've given them your word. And your world and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one, for they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. We've been talking about letting your light shine and that we are to reflect the culture of the kingdom. And Jesus reminds us that we are not of this world. 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 I think we should just do a daily exercise. When you wake up and see yourself in the mirror, you need to go, I'm not of this world. Because if you don't remind yourself that you're not of the world, then you'll start assimilating back to a world that you're not of anymore. In fact, Jesus lets you know, listen, they're not of the world as I'm not of the world. What's the answer? So that you won't seem like the world, look like the world, act like the world, respond like the world. He said, I've given them your word. The greatest thing I could ever give you is the word of God. It's the greatest thing because it is the thing that actually brings freedom. Amen. This Bible is God speaking to us, but it's also his document letting us know the history of his nation. The plans of his purpose and the lifestyle of his citizens. For the Bible's about a king, his kingdom, and his royal offspring. And Jesus said, I've given them your word. And when we have the word, the world will hate you. Haters going to hate, right? You have some if you are a believer. And if you're trying to get the world to like you, that's a problem. You should live in such a way that they hate you and want to turn towards what you have. Because you don't hate them. You're walking in the love of God. But if they won't receive the word, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus. He went on to say this. He said, now, I didn't ask you to take them out of the world. Meaning, I want you to leave them in a place that I know will hate them. I'm telling you, you got to look at yourself every morning and say, I'm not of this world. That way you're not trying to assimilate your way of living and trying to just be cozy in it. And I'm just passing. I'm just going to buy my time. I don't want to even be noticed. Well, if you're living for God, you're going to be noticed. Well, I just don't want to ruffle any feathers. If you're living for God, feathers are ruffled. Amen. It just comes with the territory. I said it comes with the territory. But that doesn't mean that Jesus was like, man, get them out quick because it's a bad deal down there. No, he said, man, trial, tribulation, distress, doesn't matter what happens. I'm for them. I'm not against them. If they love me and they're called according to my purpose, they stay walking in righteousness. They cause that kingdom to manifest in their life. I'll be right there. Amen. I'll show up in every instance. And I'll perform exactly what I want to. So he said, I, I'm not asking to take them out of the world. But he does say this, protect them from the evil one. He said, now listen, they were in a system that I brought them out of. Amen. I said, they were in a system I brought them out of. What was that system? Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, the Passion Translation says it this way. He rescued us completely from the tyrannical rule of darkness and, trans, and has translated uh, us into the kingdom realm of his beloved son. We were once lost without Christ. We were in rebellion. We were running our own course, and, and life wasn't great, but we were trying to fulfill it the best way we knew how, but always empty. No matter how we tried to do something to get a better life, it always fell short. We're looking for a new way of living. But then Christ, we recognized him, we called on his name, and he moved us into his kingdom. So the kingdom of God is not a heaven experience. It is a government experience that has exposure here on planet Earth. That's why Jesus, when he prayed, he said, he said pray this way, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Whose Father? Our not just his. He's my daddy too. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be on earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus said, any work that I've done, it's the will of my dad. 
I don't speak anything on my own initiative, but what I've heard, I say, I do. These works that you're seeing demonstrated is my Father's will. Which tells us heaven's realm doesn't stay in heaven. Heaven's realm will show up through you on this earth should you do one thing, believe. Jesus said, only believe. Only believe to the religious man whose daughter had died. Only believe. Because all things are possible to him who what? believes. Why? What's he saying? He said, now listen, I have a realm, I have a way of living that ultimately can supersede and will supersede and does supersede the type of living that you see on the earth today. But the way that you are to live in my kingdom, the culture of my kingdom is not seen with, is not seen because they said, where's the kingdom? When will we see it? He said, well, the kingdom's not here or there, but it's within you. It's in your midst, meaning it's going to first start operating, and it always operates within, yes. then without. Right. Hallelujah. And so the minute we recognized that we were in a domain, in a tyrannical rule, we had to come out. The Lord said, listen, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, and I know they'll hate them. Oh, thank you. Well, you know, I just don't want my child to be bullied and, and be hated at school. Well, the Lord left you on planet Earth where you're being bullied. But yet he's left you with the power to overcome. Amen. Now, let's train our children how to overcome. Because you're not going to be a... See, even, even believers want to try to create this little perfect environment where there's no persecution or issues with their kids. Instead of empowering them, that listen, son, when you go to school or when you get out in the workforce, or when you, you're going to have opposition. You're going to have, so there's going to be problems. But know this, just demonstrate the culture of the kingdom anyway. Walk in the light of the truth. You're going to overcome. I said, you're going to overcome. She said, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world where there's a bully. I've whipped the bully. I've stripped him of his power. I want you to teach them how to overcome the evil one. You'll protect them from the evil one. How? Because he's given us the word. I said he's given us the word. And we've got to operate in it. But we've got to demonstrate the culture of the kingdom. What did he say in John chapter 12, verse 46? He said, I've come as a light into the world so that whoever believes on me should not remain in darkness. Remember, we were in darkness. It was that tyrannical rule of darkness. It was that domain of darkness. King James calls it the kingdom of darkness. But the, the minute we heard about Jesus, we were transferred in the kingdom of his beloved son. We came out of darkness into light, and we are to walk in the light. We are to live in the light. We are to move and operate in light, and we are to let our light shine. Now, again, we didn't have light until he gave us light, which means we have no light ourselves. Light only exists in God. For first John says that in God, there's no darkness, only light. Well, until we got in Christ, we were nothing but dark. But once we got in Christ, now we are the light of God and we are to let the light shine, not put it under a bushel. But let our light shine before how many, how many men? How many men? How many men? And the light that is shining is the culture of the kingdom. Now, what do I mean by the culture of the kingdom? Well, the kingdom culture principle is this. It's the lifestyle, the way of life for the citizens manifested in their language, dress, eating habits, values, morals, and sense of self-worth and self-concept. See, a culture is a set of shared attitudes, values, morals, and practices that characterizes an organization, group, or institution. It's the behaviors and beliefs characteristic of a particular social, ethnic, or group. See, a culture is the moral principles of right and wrong behavior conforming to a standard. We are no longer to be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. Why do we have to renew our mind? Because we used to think, act, and behave in a way, in a culture, in a dominion that was dark, that was lost, that was separated from the life of God. But when we received the blood of Jesus and the forgiveness of sin, we broke into life. 
And uh, when we broke into light, our spirit man was made alive unto God. The old passed away. Behold, all things became new. And then the Holy Ghost, the third person of the Godhead, came and bore witness with our spirit that we are what? Children of God. But the problem with being born again or born from above or being a babe in Christ is that your mind still stinks. You still think wrong. You're a babe in Christ, but you're still thinking like your old way of living. And so the Holy Ghost, who is the teacher, he's the counselor. He's the one who'll guide you into how much truth? All truth. He'll teach you how many things? How many things will he teach you? Do you know he can teach you biology? He can teach you science. He can teach you mathematics. He can teach you all things because he knows all things. Anything we discover and think man has discovered something great and he's learned something, it's only because there's been some kind of revealing. We're only discovering things God's already done. Now, man will discover some things through sin that God's not a part of. He can invent some stuff that's ungodly. But as far as things that are good for humanity and how natural systems within the world are natural, nature flows and operates, you're just learning stuff that God spoke into creation. And let there be. And then you figured out how he, decide, how he had a word caused things to reproduce after its own kind. Amen. See, he already knew these things. And we have the Holy Spirit in us, who now, when we were lost, we were dead, we were separated, we were trying to maybe get to God or didn't even want to acknowledge there was a God, but we knew our life was empty. We knew at some juncture of life, when we got to the foot of the cross of Jesus, that our way of doing it ain't right. Well, then we need to carry that same thinking into his kingdom of light and say, now that I'm born again, what else was I doing that I was wrong? Well, how else was I behaving that wasn't right? How else was I responding that was a, a way that shouldn't be that way anymore? And that's why we are to not be conformed to the world, but transformed by the renewing of the mind. And let me say this. If we couldn't be right with God on our own accord, we're not going to respond in the world on our own accord either and be right in it. What we have to do is we have to be led by the Spirit of God in order to know how to navigate in this life. So there's a whole new behavior that we are to take on, right? Because we are well-versed in a behavior, some more than others. I happened to be nine years old when I got born again. So I was relatively young and hadn't really, you know, had an experience uh, of, of working out sin real well. Now, um, because I did not grow much in my teenage years and, and had my own layer of backsliding, though went to church all the time, I didn't grow in the things of God, so I experimented with sin more. But one day I met a lady on a blind date, and eventually I thought, I'm going to marry this person, and I'm in trouble because I'm ignorant. And if I'm going to get married, and I knew that marriage was till death do you part, I better go to the one who authored marriage in the first place, and I better get right with him because we're at a severe deficit if I don't turn my life around. Now, if you compared what I was doing to other people, yeah, I might not have been a master of sin. But we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And man, when you find out, I'll never forget this. The Lord taught me. I remember one time I was reading a scripture about the woman, you know, that uh, was a prostitute came and washed Jesus' feet, and the religious guy was all put out by it, and Jesus said, hey, let me ask you a little story. Let me give you a story. There's a guy that owed about 100 bucks. Another guy owed $3 billion. And they both went, couldn't, neither one of them could pay. Said neither one of them could pay. And uh, he forgave him. He said, which one do you think I love more? He said, well, I was supposed the one who had greater debt, Right? And so um, at that point, he said, You've, you know, you're right. He says, though this woman, you know, I know what man or woman she is. Uh, her sins are many, right? Uh, when I came into your house, you didn't even offer to wash my feet, but she'd been washing my feet with her hair and her tears. You didn't offer me a kiss, but she'd been kissing my feet the whole time. He said, the whole world's going to hear about this woman. Are you with me? But notice the whole world's heard about that guy. 
Are you with me? But it bothered me, honestly, because I was a little put out, just to be honest with you. I'm like, now, Lord, I this doesn't make sense to me because <laughs> are you saying that I can't have a, a, a profound love for you unless I become this, like, horrible sinner and then repent? I mean, what advantage is there to just try to live right your whole life? Get born again at a young age and be passionate for God. If you concluded that you have to be this horrible sinner. And I'll never forget, he said, what's the payment for lying? Being disobedient to your parents? I said, eternity separated from God is death. He said, it all pays the same. So when I realized that the minute I disobeyed my mama one day, I was destined to be eternally separated from God, and it was a debt that I could not pay. And it didn't matter how well-versed I got in sin, one was enough to give me the same issue. Because there ain't no $100 here and a billion dollars in sin there. It's eternity separated from God. Are you with me? And I realize I can love you because just one separated me eternally. Right? So we, I was, but I, I know. I've been around it. I've worked it. I've worked sin. And some of you have worked it a lot better than others. So that your mindset's kind of like there. You see it that way. You respond that way. What did he say in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3? He says, and he has made you alive who were once dead in trespasses and sin in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom we also had our way of life in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the thoughts, and were by nature children of wrath even as the others. See that? Now notice we all walk this way. Verse 2 says, we once walked. One translation says, formerly walked. That word walk means this. It means to live, to re relegate one's life. It means to conduct oneself. So how did we conduct ourselves according to the course of this world? How do we conduct ourselves according to the prince of the power of the air? How do we conduct ourselves with, uh, according to the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience? Man, we could hear a thought from the devil. We'd hear a thought from our flesh, and we'd respond and act on it, and we were good about it. I mean, we were selfish people. We had selfish desires. We always wanted to manipulate and work everything to our advantage. And we were good at it, some better than others. So our mindset, our behavior, our way of thinking, our way of responding, somebody do something to us, boom, we're going to do it back twice then. If we even think they were going to do something, we would go after them. I'll never forget David Mackey when he talks about the old man. He says, man, if he felt like somebody was going to do something to him physically, he'd go ahead and knock out the biggest guy and then hit two or three more. And he said, I'd hit them first. Are you with me? That was the old man. Said, I just go on in there and hit the first one. Wouldn't talk, I just hit them. Just hit them. Right? I mean, it may have just been an argument and they'd have walked out, but not him. He'd just punch you in the face and let's hit the next guy and just to make sure you're not going to mess with me. Are you with me? <laughs> We've done the same thing. We've gotten into a situation where we responded with our mouth. We punched so many people in the, in the face with our mouths, man. Something would happen and we'd pop off. Have you ever heard that term? You just popped off. We'd pop off with our mouth. We'd pop off with an attitude. We'd pop off with something. We were good at it. And the Lord's trying to say, listen, this way of living, this a course of the world, you're going to have to change that. Because the course of the world is not reflecting the kingdom of God. There are behaviors, there are attitudes, there are actions that are, and, and lifestyles that are no longer a part of God's kingdom. In fact, they won't inherit it. So you cannot be formerly of something, step over into something new, and desire to keep your foot back here. 
Well, I'm going to live this life under the blood. No, a life under the blood is a totally different life. Hallelujah. And here's the thing. God didn't come just for your spirit. He came for all of you, your spirit, soul, and body. I mean, he's concerned about your body. Oh, he don't care about my body. We're going to leave this suit. You're getting a new one. You're never going to exist for eternity without the threefold nature man, spirit, soul, and body. But we act like all God's concerned about is our spirit man. No, he's concerned about our soul realm. He's concerned about our thinking. Because if he can get you to think like what you've been created like, then the culture of his kingdom can manifest. Because Jesus, when he came to earth, although we know he was a suffering servant, as we call him. And yes, I agree. He suffered and he served us. But he had the mentality of a king. Jesus didn't walk around this life like, oh, poor pitiful me. I'm just suffering for my father. He stuck me down on planet Earth. I'm going to die. That's not how he walked. He walked around stately. He'd go into a synagogue, pull out scripture, and he said, you've heard the ancients say, but I say unto you. He spoke like the child of royalty. He knew he was a king, and he knew he was going to bring the kingdom back for all of his kids who will call on his name. Yes. Amen. He said, if I cast out a devil with the finger of God, you know the kingdom is here. Now, you can't talk kingdom and not know what a king, what is associated with kingdom. It's not like he didn't know. And if you read the Bible, he said the kingdom of God is like this and the kingdom of heaven is like that. So he understood kingdom, which is king's dominion, and I am the king. When Pilate said, he said, are you the king of the Jews? He said, did somebody tell you about me or did you learn this on your own? John chapter 18. He said, man, I, 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 I'm not a Jew. He said, your people handed you over me, the chief priests. He said, my kingdom is not of this realm. All that means is it doesn't mean it's not in this realm. It says it's not of it. And how, how, does, how do we know this? Because he goes on and says this. It's not of this realm. For if it were, meaning if my kingdom operated like the world. Because he prefaces, he lets us know. My kingdom's not of this realm. If it were, my servants would not let me be handed over to the Jews. Have you ever read the Bible? Where all of a sudden his nation needed to go against the Midianite army. And he says, y'all just hang right here. I got one special force angel I'm going to send in. <laughs> I'll send one in. He took out 185,000 men. One. Remember what Jesus said in the garden? Peter, put your sword up. Don't you know I could call a legion of angels down right now? That's total planet destruction. That is the annihilation of humanity. <laughs> right? A legion of angels. And what was he relating that to? The Roman legion army, which was about 2,000 men. And if one angel can take out 185, 185,000, this is just what we see biblically. You go ahead and do the math yourself. Right? So he says, listen, my kingdom doesn't operate like the system down here. Because the system that's currently here, my dad never wanted. Are you with me? See, if we go back to the book of beginnings, we know. God created the heavens and the earth. He placed his crowning creation called man in the 26th verse of the first chapter of Genesis. And he says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let him have rule or dominion. Amen. We hear suffering servant and we get bothered by rule and dominion. Yet, the suffering servant came, meaning I'm going to suffer because the world hates me. I'm going to serve humanity by laying down my life as their king. I'm not going to ask my angels to get involved, and I'm not going to ask the rest of humanity because they're not my people anyway. They've all fallen from the Lord. Their daddy is the devil. No, I'm going to lay down my life as the king. I'll take it back up, and then all who call on my name, I'll crown them. Yeah. How do we know he'll crown? Because he's the king of? Who are those kings? 
See, we act like all of a sudden they're just these few special people. No, this whole nation is a nation of kings. Hallelujah. And so man was to have dominion. But when the serpent, or we call him the devil, as you know, Satan, came into the garden through the serpent, he deceived Eve. He caused Adam to rebel. Adam ate the fruit and gave his dominion over to the devil. That's why he's the domain of darkness. What's he doing? He's always trying to keep you from discovering who you really are. And as long as he can use an excuse to tell you you're something other than what God says about you and that somebody can control your identity other than God, then you'll always be a slave to him. But the minute you say, I'm going to find out who God called me to be, man, then nobody can stop you, even if you're persecuted, because you can pull in God's kingdom culture in your life. But in order to do that, you got to change your thinking. You got to change your behavior. You got to change your response. You got to change your eyesight and not live by what you see and how you've been conditioned to respond. You're going to have to change your thinking and live by faith. Are you with me? So this walk that we are to live, we walked away. Uh, the, those ways relegated our lives. In fact, when Jesus was tempted of the devil, said he took him in the Luke's account to a high pinnacle and showed him all the domains or kingdoms in a moment of time. Didn't show him religions. And he said, all this uh, dominion I'll give you for it's been handed over to me. That's why we got to read our Bible. It's been handed over to me. He said, I'll give them to you, but all you got to do is this. What? Bow down and worship me. He wanted God to bow to him. He's never changed the agenda. Isaiah 14, he wanted his throne above the most high. I just want creator God to bow to me. Amen. So when Jesus, who did not do this, said, listen, I'm what he didn't know is I'm taking it back anyway. I don't have to get it through you. <laughs> and then once he's stripped in the devil of his authority and power over humanity, humanity now can come out from underneath the tyrannical rule of darkness by calling on the name of Jesus. And the minute you get into God's kingdom through the blood of Jesus, then he'll put in the great teacher of the kingdom called the Holy Ghost, and he'll say, now I got to get your mind cleaned up because I need you to think like a king. That shouldn't bother you. Why? Because we followed the example of our king. We're here to serve, and we will suffer some things because we are of a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, a holy nation that the world's going to hate. I'm not trying to get the world to love me, but I do want to shine the light of the kingdom to the world in hopes they will accept the same king that I have. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 10, it says it this way, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and have raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenlies, uh, in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus, so that in the age to come he might show the exceeding greatness of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved, how? Through faith, and that is not of yourself, it is a gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. You couldn't get to God, he came to you. Verse 10, for we are his what? Workmanship created in Christ Jesus to good works, which God has before ordained that we should what? Walk in them. Same Greek word of what we walked in, our former manner, or we once walked according to the course of this world. It regulated our lives. It it governed our lives. It was our course, our action. But then we got born again, and God says, now I've got a way for you to walk. Uh, things that should regulate your life, things that should be the conduct of your life, the things that should be how you live now. 
And in order for you to live it, you'll have to change the way you think and the way you respond. In essence, you're going to have to embrace a kingdom culture. I said a kingdom culture. A way of living, behaving, acting, and responding. Remember, you're not of this world. I said you're not of this world. Yeah, thank you, Lord. He says this in Ephesians 5, 8. He says, for you were, uh, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk, walk, same Greek word, walk as children of the light. Let it regulate. Let it be the way you conduct your life. Amen. My life's not my own. See, I've been bought and paid for, which means now I needed his salvation I needed his deliverance. I needed his redemption. I wanted a better quality of life. I wanted life. Yeah. Understand, I was dead. Yeah. A dead man breathing. Yeah. I was a dead man breathing. But then I got true life in God where there's no darkness. And now he wants to teach me and train me to live in a way that is stately, that is honorable, that is holy, that is worthy. And so I freely give up this old thinking to be transformed into God's way of thinking and doing and behaving and acting in any given situation. Amen. Are you with me? Notice in the beginning of creation. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, over all the cattle, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, over all the earth. And so man had dominion. Genesis 1 and 2, it's a perfect world, no sin. Him and his wife freely ruled, both male and female, had dominion. God's realm invaded this realm, and it was perfect peace, no sin. But when Adam fell from dominion, sin, Romans 5, 5, entered the world. Through one man's what? Transgression. Sin. What entered the world? Sin. What entered the world? Sin. So here's his son, Adam. Not Jesus, the son of God, God in the flesh, but Adam, God's son. Here's Adam's God's son, has been separated from dad. He's put him out the garden. And he didn't get in a rush to respond. He came down. Adam, where are you? Same question he's asking humanity today. What position are you in now? He says, well, it's that woman you gave me. Blame God. He goes to Eve. He says, okay, Eve, what'd you do? I was deceived. She told the truth. The serpent deceived me. I ate the fruit. Okay, he goes to the serpent. He says, listen, I'm going to bring my seed of the woman. She didn't lie to me. I'm going to bring the seed of her because the man's seed's corrupt. And I'm going to bring that seed, and he is going to crush your head, though you'll bruise his heel. Right? right. Who is that seed? Jesus. What's his name? Jesus. Did Jesus show up in the first pregnancy of the first virgin? Yes. Oh, my gosh. No. You know how many virgins there were before Mary? Every woman was a virgin before Mary. What I'm saying is the minute Eve had the first girl, somebody had a female. Because Cain can't get married unless somebody had a female. And the minute that female was born, by all rights, they were a virgin. What I'm saying is God wasn't moved. He was not moved that sin or a wrong had been committed in his creation to immediately have to respond. Oh. He's like, I'm bringing my son. <laughs> so, son doesn't come. Noah is living, and mankind is horrible. I mean, God, so bad that God's like, I hate I even made them. I regret it. I regret I made them. I'm going I'm to I'm flood the whole planet. Why didn't we send Jesus? Now, I'm not questioning the Father. I'm just saying God thinks a lot different than us. 
See, when something's wrong, what do we, we want to jump in there and fix it. Oh. But that's not kingdom culture. Kingdom culture, let's do what dad says about the situation right now. See, the world jumps in, wants to do things, respond, do stuff. Why? Because they respond with the flesh. Somebody tells you ugly, what do you typically do? Well, you ugly too. I mean, we respond pretty quick. We're pretty fast in these things. Somebody cut you off. Now, your old self, I know what your old self would have done. You'd have got right up behind them, beeped the horn, told them they were number one, but with a different finger. <laughs> You're number one. You're number one, right? Yeah, I know. I mean, that's what happened. I know. This happened to me when I was at Bible school. Man, I, was, I was pulling out of my Bible school. I looked this way. I looked that way. I looked this way. Nothing was coming. So, you know, I looked back one more time, and I pulled out. Well, somebody somewhere come fly. I didn't see them, man. And I pulled out, apparently I pulled out in front of them. Maybe they were catching up speed. I don't know. But all of a sudden, man, when I came out, they beeped a the horn, right? I felt bad, but I went on. When next thing you know, they whipped around right there in the middle of the road. U turn. And then got right up behind me and told me I was number one. <laughs> yeah. And things that I could do to myself. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, this, this, this thing came over me. <laughs> Have you ever had a thing come over you? Yeah, but the thing I'm talking about, most people don't think about. Because the kingdom came over me. See, the culture came over me. All of a sudden, I whipped right into a store. And they whipped right into a store, and I jumped out of my vehicle. And I come around. And I went right up to their vehicle, and the window was already down. Yeah. Now, your old man tell you what your old man would have done. But I'm a new man. I said, I'm a new man. And so that, that guy in his vehicle leaned back into a seat, over into his bench seat. Why was he doing this? What's he anticipating? He's anticipating his culture. Maybe he's regretting that he said I was number one and thinking I'm fixing to try to prove it. I'm number one. You're going to be number two here in a minute. Right? And I went in the window with my hand. That happened. I put my hand through his window. It was rolled down. But when I did, it was an open hand, and I said, man, I am so sorry that I cut you off, I apologize. I look both ways, and man, you just came out of nowhere. Will you forgive me? Well, he leaned up. And he started to stutter. I don't think he was a stutterer, <laughs> but I think he was taken back. Yeah, okay. Thanks, man. God bless you. <laughs> I mean, he got sanctified quick. <laughs> it's amazing what the love of God. See, what I did is I allowed the culture of the kingdom to dictate my response in that moment. Now, honestly, more times than likely, I probably would have just kept going and they would have eventually got tired of following, you know, would have felt like they have, their voice had been heard and would have went back and it had been over. I mean, I've been in many of those conflicts where people beep at me, look at me weird and strange at different times, you know, and I don't feel compelled by the kingdom to try to run them down and let them know I apologize. My point is, though, my response was from the kingdom. I, I didn't think about this man could have a gun. See, like some of y'all are thinking right now. You know, I can't believe you did that. You do what the Spirit of God says, you'll be protected. Now, all I know is when he stands before Jesus one day, because he will, I hope it's at the judgment seat of Christ, not the great white throne judgment. Either case, if it's at the judgment seat of Christ, it could have been where the Lord's like, man, you're here today. And he goes, yeah, that guy that I cussed out and told him was number one, he asked me to forget. And that stuck with me the rest of my life. I used to hate that school every time I passed by it. But it's because I've been called to it. 
And I was rebelling, not wanting to follow God, not wanting to do anything. And then this one student came out and felt like I was justifying their, their stupidity and how, you know, they're a bunch of hypocrites and how could he cut out in front of me, actually stop. I mean, I'm not making this up. I don't know that this is true. This is all makeup stuff, right, hypothetical? But that could happen. Or he can stand before the great white throne judgment. And the Lord says, I had a, one of my kings ask you to forgive them to demonstrate to you my love. That they didn't come against you when you responded in kind, when they pulled out by accident, and then you responded and retaliated from your world and was cussing them out and ready to beat them up. That they didn't come around and get in a fight with you, but they extended peace. And these are all those moments I was trying to talk to you, and you rejected me. See, our culture's different. We once walked away. But the Lord did not send his seed into the first virgin that was born after Eve. He flooded the whole planet and started with a whole family. And still, problems existed. Thousands of years went by before the seed manifested. Which tells me this. God knows exactly where we're at globally in eternity. And the Father's way of responding to sin, because as believers, we see a lot of sin. We see injustices done, bigotries, discrimination, prejudice, inequalities. We see these things globally. Poverty. Abuse of power. I see this all the time. We shouldn't be ignorant of it. In fact, if we are trained in righteousness, we should be able to clearly see what's good and what's evil. But how do we respond? Now, that's a whole other question. That's a whole other question. Because the minute God did respond, everything gets set in place in that moment. Because if God responds, doesn't mean the world will respond favorably. How do I know this? Why did he not put King Jesus in the womb of a virgin when King David was on the throne? King David loved God. Don't you think King David would have went and worshipped where the virgin would have been just like the wise men? Don't you think David would have given yeah, David would have done that. The problem is David never could have sent him to the cross. But King Herod now, King Herod and Caesar of Rome and Pilate, the governor, could totally send an innocent man to a cross. So when the king showed up, the world hated But the king didn't respond to their hatred in like, although he was righteous, although he knew every wrongdoing. See, Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says it this way. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the what? flesh, but according to the Spirit. If God's kingdom culture is going to be seen in the world, the only place it can start is with His church. Is with His church. Is with His church. So the church has to learn how to be led by the Spirit and not by sight. And just like you and me, we both lived away. We've had passions with an old lifestyle. We've had things in our old lifestyle that we were convinced were right. Yet the Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end lies death. Paul himself said, I know a guy. I know a guy. I was that guy that I wanted to do right. And everything that I tried to do right, I found out it was wrong. And all the stuff that was wrong that I didn't want to do, I found myself doing. He said, what a wretched man am I? Who will save me? 
from this life of sin. But thanks be to God. I said, thanks be to God. Man, Saul of Tarsus went with the word of God to condemn, imprison, and murder believers of the way was convinced that he was doing the right thing for God. And when he's holding the coats while they stone a man named Stephen who was wrongly murdered, who recounted the whole history in Acts 7 of the nation of Israel and then gets down and says, ah, but this Christ whom you've crucified has laid out his blood even for the Gentiles. They couldn't stand it, couldn't handle it, started to rip their clothes, grab rocks, drug the man out, gave their uh, coats to Saul of Tarsus who says, yeah, kill this guy. And they stoned the man. And while he is being stoned in the public of everybody, everyone's seeing it. He lifts up his eyes to heaven and doesn't say, Lord, vindicate this injustice, but instead says, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And in that moment, something begins to go to work in the life of Saul. See, a kingdom response at the hostility of the world does more work than a hostile response in the name of God. Hallelujah. Saul of Tarsus did not get born again that day. In fact, it empowered his position. Vindicated him more. Yet, on the road to Damascus... He had an encounter. You know what? Fox, CNN, MSNBC, NBC, ABC, CBS, One American News, Epic Times, uh, The Blaze, uh, NPR, BBC. I'm just throwing out a bunch of you know news outlets. They're not going to give you other road to Damascus experiences that people are having in the earth today because the king of glory has a way to communicate with humanity as his church prays. As we recognize there's going to be hostility towards us because we're not of this world. But our response won't be worldly. It'll be from another realm. Because we're not, we're not these individuals who walk according to the flesh. I'm done wrong. You got me to deal with. If that's your response, you're not demonstrating a culture of the kingdom. If you take up another person's offense, you are not operating in the kingdom of God. We are to walk according to the Spirit. You could say, wow, that ain't right. And the Lord said, yeah, that ain't right. What am I supposed to do about that? The Lord may say pray. The Lord may say organize. The Lord may say a lot of things. I don't know what the Lord will say, but whatever he says, that's what you should do. Because there's nothing happening in planet Earth that God's not keeping record of. There's no thing happened to anyone on the planet ever that won't be dealt with. If it doesn't get under the blood in forgiveness, it will be paid out in the lake of fire. Period. Nothing goes unnoticed with our king. This is why we can be like our heavenly father. There is sin in the world. But I don't have to do an immediate response. All I got to do is respond as the Father wants in his time frame and how he wants me to, and his ultimate kingdom culture will manifest.
You know, Abraham died. David died. Moses, you know, he died. Elisha died. Samuel died. Nathan died. Mordecai died. Esther died. Sarah died. All before being born again. And it tells us when the, when the thief recognized on the cross, this is Jesus. He is the Messiah. I'm wrong for cussing him out and calling him all that. I'm the one who's rightly being judged. This man's innocent. He said, Jesus, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And he says, today, you'll be with me in paradise. Well, who's in paradise? All those that I just mentioned had died. For God said that there was this rich guy that died, and he had this beggar that was at his table who died also named Lazarus. And Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom called paradise, but the rich ruler went to the grave. And he was in torment, and he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham and said, Abraham, send Lazarus over so that he can just dip my tongue with water on my tongue because I'm in great torment. And what did Abraham say? He said, there's this great a fix, gulf, uh, this expanse between you and I. We're all in the grave, but we're in paradise. Why? Because we all believed that the Messiah would come. The blood would be shed. We would be forgiven. We were walking in the righteousness allotted to us in our dispensation, and we will be one day redeemed. But that rich man didn't do it. He said, well, send Lazarus back because I got five brothers. They're worse than I am. He said, unless they listen to the word and the prophets... Even if someone's raised from the dead, they're not going to listen. When Jesus went down into the grave, he led captivity captive. Yeah. Notice, here's sin in the earth, and the Lord says, Abraham, if you just do what I say, if you just do what I say, if you just do what I say. And when Abraham dies, he's like, that's all right. I'll go get him. He wasn't sweating. He wasn't fretting. God's ultimate plan knew, we're going to get them out anyway. Justice will be served. Grave, you will not be able to hold them because when I go down, I'll conquer death, hell, and the grave. I'll get the keys to the grave. I will resurrect them with me. The Bible tells us in the Gospels, man, for the, when they, he busted open the graves, they walked out on the streets of Jerusalem before they were caught up together with him in the air. Wow. Are you with me? So God's time frame and his culture's response is way different. Way different. This is why we don't live by the flesh. Walk by it. Let it dictate our actions, our responses. But we're led by the Spirit. And in the things going on in our world today, if there's ever been a day for his church to rise in the Spirit, it's today. Make no mistake about it. We'll, we are the only ones who are the experts to call what's good, good, and evil, evil. Because the world will get it in reversed in the last days, the Bible says. We are the experts to determine what can really happen in the world because we actually have the word of the king, and it's the final say. Amen. And we don't have to rush to an occasion. We just rush to God and say, King Jesus... And how do we, your church, respond since you're the head of the church? What do you want us to do? And I'm telling you, as we walk in love towards one another, as we really, between each other, demonstrate the kingdom of God, what the world is looking for culturally, this type of utopia, this place where everybody can get along, this place where there's not actual prejudices and those types of things, the greatest place to be able to find it is in the church of the living God where everyone's growing into the likeness of Christ. I can't say today that somebody's not in this congregation prejudiced because they may have an old thinking, but I can guarantee you this. I'll give you the word and drive that prejudice out. 
I can't say that somebody's in this congregation that is going to get sick time after time after time, but I can guarantee I'll give you the word till you understand and can recognize that by his stripes ye were healed, so you are healed, and you can walk in the healing power of God because the kingdom of God has a health care system. And it doesn't have to have a copay. You don't have to worry about all that. Jesus' stripes are the payment of it. All you got to do is believe and receive. Amen. I can't guarantee there's not somebody in here that's dealing with depression, but I can guarantee I'll give you the word to where you can move that depression and get that mindset change and all of a sudden get the joy of the Holy Ghost. And no matter what you experience in life, you can laugh at it. You can laugh in the joy of the Spirit because the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And I can tell you this. That as we continue to examine the behavior, lifestyle, and the leading that we are to do in God's kingdom culture, I can guarantee you that we'll find ourselves being very passionate, like he is, to be able to take care of things. But we won't be delusional that as we begin to move with the Spirit, we will have this common knowledge. We will and we must meet resistance because we're not of this world. They will hate us, but they'll know we were there. I've heard this statement more than one time. Where someone, you know, that was seem weaker <laughs> gets in this confrontation with someone. And they'll say, you know, you may be bigger and stronger than me. And you may ultimately win, but you'll know I was there. Right? The thing is, is that we actually can't ever be beat. The Bible says um, that God is my helper. It's him we trust. What can man do to me? The Lord says, don't worry about it if they kill you. Don't worry about that. He said, don't even be afraid of that stuff. He said, what you need to be afraid is the one who can take your spirit and put it into the lake of fire. What's he saying? He says, if man takes your spirit, man, out of your body by killing you, I'll vindicate you. If you just read Revelation, there are martyrs underneath the throne of God saying, when are you going to vindicate our blood? And the Lord says, it's coming. It's coming. Make no mistake about it. I'll vindicate it. There's not one thing happening in planet Earth today that the culture of the kingdom won't overtake. And all that will be left ultimately is his culture. But I'm going to show you how you can respond in situations that directly affect your kingdom. Culture in a world. I'll close with this story. I was in the Florida Army National Guard for nine years. I worked full-time as a uh, federal technician in the Army National Guard out at Camp Blanding. Um, just in Clay County near Stark, Florida. And um, I was over a warehouse. I worked at, it was called the USPFO or DOL at one other time. Anyway, um, we were logistics. We did supply. So whenever the troops came in, they could order stuff from us to supply whatever unit's needs were. And I had what they call serviceable goods. That means I got the, basically the new stuff or stuff that got transferred in by unit. We could get it to another unit, whatever the case may be. I was warehouse one. Anyway, one day I was at work, and I was in the clothing section of the warehouse, seated on a pallet, talking to some coworkers about the things of God, actually. And, you know, had kind of God, by the anointing, had kind of pulled the attention in. Well, uh, a retired warrant officer, a W-4, high as you can be except for a W-5, which takes over the whole warrant officer side. There's only one of those, but he was a W-4 in his retirement, had come back as contract labor to help with the warehouse, had ran it for years themselves. And um, came in and was standing around, and some things I was saying, obviously, they hated so, the next thing you know, I don't know how it occurred, um, but I was in my pants. I just had my T-shirt on. My blouse was off. You could wear that. And um, 
I didn't shave that morning, so it was a little stubble. But, you know, not so much that full-time technicians, that's, I mean, you can get gigs, sure, right? But typically, it's not a problem. Anyway, this warrant officer, which wasn't a warrant anymore, civilian, slapped me in the face. In that moment, I, I think they thought themselves, what did I do? Now, here's the thing. Naturally speaking, I could have, I had witnesses. I could have taken this thing somewhere. I could have legally done something here. I could have done something through chains of command because I have been slapped in the face by the one in authority over me. Well, in their shock and dismay, they ended up, you know, basically digging for more issues. You can wear chains. Um, you know, they just have to be underneath your T-shirt, of which mine was. I think a little piece was kind of hanging right here. So they ended up going in and pulling it out from underneath my shirt and said, well, what's this? Well, back in the day, there used to be this thing called WWJD. What would Jesus do? And I had WWJD on a little leather necklace that I had on. So I turned to him, I said, it stands for what would Jesus do? And he would turn the other cheek. So here it is. See, that's kingdom culture. I thank God for the Holy Ghost that day. That I didn't let my flesh respond. Now, I was way younger than this guy. Sure, could I have retaliated? Could I have demonstrated my natural manhood? in front of my peers? Sure, many people do, especially the course of this world, right? But I turned the other cheek. They obviously called them off guard and they just walked away. You know, I don't think I talked to anyone else about that. I, I think it's just, everybody's just kind of dumbfounded. We just went on to work. This individual, I've been over to their house before and had a particular chair that was made out of leather. It looked like a director's chair. And on the back of it, you know, where you put your name, they had God on it. That's how they viewed themselves. They slapped me in the face, and I turned the other cheek. It's culture of the kingdom. My wife and I went to Bible school. And um, went through our whole first year. And going to our second year, the Lord spoke to me at the end of our first year and says, don't try to save money for school. Just take care of your family. And that's all I did, man. I mean, whoo, you know, rubbing a couple pennies together would be awesome. I mean, you're believing God for air almost. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, just believe in God. You're, you're exercising your faith. Well, we were about two weeks from school starting. Nothing. We don't have nothing to start. Nothing. And I'm thanking him that he's my provider. He said it. I'm just following him. You know, the life of faith, man, it gets you close to stuff. It get, try to get you to worry. But faith won't worry. Faith is say, no, I ain't going to worry about that. My king said something. Well, my wife gets a call of a couple that was in the area. And wanted to swing through and take me and my wife and kids out to eat. And so we did. Then they bought clothes for my kids, all three of them, to go to school the next year. Because they were in the area. They had been about 250 miles close to us. And drove up to see us. We said our goodbyes and they left. And then the wife calls back and says, Marcy... How are y'all doing with school tuition? She said, well, we believe in God. And the woman says, we're going to take care of your tuition this year, both of you. Her husband was the guy who slapped me in the face. See, if I wouldn't have done kingdom culture, then my enemy wouldn't have been able to pay That couple has been to this church. 
He has since given his life to God. Both of them had symptoms of disease in their body. Came to a meeting when Pastor Hagen was here with the Living Faith Crusade when he walked through my, the door. And I, he was looking around. He goes, wow, I'm so proud of y'all. The guy who slapped my face. I'm so proud of you. And I looked at him and I said, you're responsible for this because you gave. Now, I could have said because you slapped me. But I, didn't, I don't think he's ready to hear that one. But because you gave and because you invested in us in our last year, it empowered us and equipped us to be here in this moment right now. And here we are, brought them down, honored them on the front row. Honored them when we transitioned the service. And then all of a sudden, Pastor Hagen always does healing services on Wednesday night. He'd be with us Sunday night, I think it was Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday. So Tuesday night, his last night, it was a Sunday night. And he got up at the end of his, he goes, you know what? I always do this on the last night, but I sense tonight I need to pray for healing. And the first two up was that couple. And he laid hands on them, and both of them got healed that night. It's because the kingdom culture manifested instead of a world culture. And what this small moment that I did not vindicate a wrong turned into years of blessing me, my household, and their lives and their healing. So church, I'm saying, it's the culture of the kingdom. We got to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not bring the righteousness of God. And when you look around in this room right now, we are a bunch of different looking people, but we have an allegiance to one king, and we love the body, and we'll care for each other, and we are to be an example that the world would look at us and say, how are y'all getting it right with all that's going on? How could you sit across from each other? How could you hug like that? Because of the blood of Jesus. Because we're a different family, we're in a different culture, and his anointing allows us to live this way, behave this way, act this way, talk this way. And you can get in if you call on the name of Jesus.